Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the Late Night Talk with me, your host, Ahmed Ali, and another night, another sorrowful night across the year as we commemorate the martyrdom of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. Now, when every method of persuasion failed over 13 years of preaching of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam, the Prophet resorted to, to the sword to remove any types of mischief, any types of evil, and to remove the people from their ignorance of that time. A lot of people have this claim. However, there are many misconceptions on how the Prophet delivered Islam and the way he did da'wah to Islam and how he brought it upon the people. Tonight we have with us a very special guest, Sheikh Usama Al-Attar, joining us tonight to talk about the misconceptions revolving around the da'wah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Shaykh as-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant you uh, the success of reaching Karbala every year. Ilahi Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. You know, every year we do have you, uh, whether in uh, one occasion or a different occasion. Alhamdulillah, we have you for the martyrdom of Prophet Muhammad. Now, Shaykhna, um, a lot of people have this idea in their mind that uh, the Prophet didn't preach Islam in a peaceful way. He preached it in a different way. Before we get to that point, we need to follow uh, what's so important about da'wah that the Prophet had to emphasize on that spreading Islam in a peaceful way or a non-peaceful way as we'll get to it but the importance of da'wah what's so important about it Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alayhi wa we believe that Islam mm -hmm. is the universal message of happiness yeah. and joy in dunya and in akhirah Mm -hmm. Therefore, if someone really implements the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will achieve the highest ranks of joy yep. and happiness in dunya and in akhirah. Yep. Now, if I may give an example, if there were a doctor who invents a new medication mm -hmm. to treat a particular disease, yes. for example, cancer, wouldn't this doctor then want to propagate this medication so that the whole world can benefit from it, all those who are suffering from illnesses, can be cured from it that would be the logical thing to do mm -hmm. in a similar fashion in a similar yes. manner when there is a message that we can spread peace yeah. can spread love can spread happiness and joy to the individual and the society at large yeah. and the whole world then wouldn't one wants to share it with the whole world mm -hmm. and that is the essence of da'wah inviting mm -hmm. people to the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, one of the uh, reasons that people uh, do call us out as, as Muslims when, when it comes to the Quran, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning in uh, chapter six, 16, verse 125, invite uh, to the way of your Lord, wad'u ila rabbikum bil hasana. Invite the people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wisdom and kind words and manners. Yet we see in other verses uh, where a lot of people do criticize Islam on this, um, is that chase them down wherever you see them, you know, mm -hmm. and under every rock. Right. Now, why do we see contradictions or is this not a contradicting? Uh, we need to understand the context of these verses. Uh -huh. You know, any text, religious text, when you take a look at it, you have to understand the underlying essence of the statements. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's open for misinterpretation. Yes. And this is open for all religious texts especially divine religious yeah. texts. Yeah. Now, in this context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to invite people to the religious of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays down the methodology. As you mentioned, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawadat al-hasana wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan. So there are three methodologies that the Quran suggests or the Quran indicates about inviting people to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first Allah says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika, invite people to the path of your Lord using al-hikmah, wisdom. Wisdom here, some of the mufassireen say, using a logical argument. Mm -hmm. This usually works when you're dealing with scholars, ulama. Yes. When you're dealing with the ulama, when the scholars, Logical arguments work. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses several logic, logical arguments in the Holy Quran. Yeah. Allah says, who created the heavens and the earth? You know, Ask them, who created all this? Mm -hmm. How could all this come from vanity? Indeed, in themselves and in the world are signs. 
let them look at the skies do they see any discrepancies do they see and so on and so forth many yeah. of these verses which use logical context they do to indicate the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. uh, can there be two gods the Quran says then there will be corruption yeah. and problems mm -hmm. a logical argument as well yeah. so that is one context the logical context then virtuous admonishment kind words some of the Mufassirin interestingly they say this is the language of the heart this is kind of where you kind of talk to people using their emotions stirring their emotions so sometimes logical discussion or argument may not be very convincing to mm -hmm. some people yeah but emotions can be sometimes yes. for example you can tell an individual that you know even for Muslims you need to pray it's haram that you don't pray he says yeah I know but you know may Allah guide me that's a logical argument you're telling him you know Allah wants you to pray you're a Muslim you need to pray this is, will help you yeah he doesn't believe he doesn't buy your logic mm -hmm. although it's logical yeah however if this person's let's say God forbid loved ones yeah. die um, yeah. his mother passes away and now he's in the state of grief you know as he's now maybe attending her, her funeral and they're trying to bury now this person says well look at your mother now imagine what would happen to you if you come there one day you know wouldn't your mother would love to see you praying wouldn't you love to pray for her and now you're using your emotions and sometimes it works so a person starts following the path of Allah because of his emotions yeah. so that's the thing. third methodology is Jidal Jidal is an argumentative mm -hmm. approach that approach is for those who really want to argue for the sake of arguing yes not for the sake of learning the Quran gives an example that's, that's an argumentative approach where this Ubay ibn Khalaf who was one of the mushrikeen in Mecca went and dug an old bone and brought it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he made it into dust and he blew it in the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he said Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he said do you claim that your God can revive these old dusty bones Allah replies to him in Surah Yasin he says tell him yes the same way Allah <coughs> created them in the first place from without Nothing. anything yeah Allah can create them again without anything you know when they're also uh, uh, having nothing so or don't have anything that's an argumentative approach this, yes. is, this is these are the three modes so we have al-hikmah which is the logical argumentative approach we have al-maw'ad al-hasana which is the emotional approach and we have the jidal which is the argumentative approach interestingly just to highlight something really quickly yes we find Ahlul Bayt really focusing with Imam al Hussein on the emotional side the emotional mm -hmm. side because they say you know cry for Imam al Hussein hold the majalis for Imam Hussein pretend to cry for Imam Hussein because the emotional aspect is the most powerful mm -hmm. because they soften the hearts when people mm -hmm. start crying their hearts become softer and hence they start to accept the admonishment and mm -hmm. hence the transformation may be even stronger mm -hmm. not that they did not use the logical arguments of course they did but the emotional aspect is very powerful so Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam emphasized this yes. portion for that yes now you mentioned that uh, the Ahlul Bayt emphasized that Imam al Hussein used the emotional aspect uh, of da'wah of uh, no not, sorry not Imam al Hussein Ahlul Bayt used to, to use the emotional aspect of Imam Hussein's martyrdom uh -huh. to propagate the message of, of Imam Islam. al Hussein salam okay. alayhi, and to transform people and, and, and exchange mm -hmm. and, and change them. Yes, now if, if they're using the martyrdom of Imam Hussein al Islam, Imam al Hussein resorted to the sword though. He, he fought, I mean, to, to spread Islam. Whereas, you know, we don't see anyone nowadays um, striving to establish an Islamic state other than the ones who are so-called Islamic State mm -hmm. who actually want to right. uh, establish a government now w we see that you know I isn't something co controversial right there mm -hmm. you know we see that the ones who are actually wanting to serve Islam not establishing government but yet the ones who want to establish the government are those who are really care more about Islam well let's take a look at the Prophet's approach what approach did the Prophet use? Mm -hmm. First of all, he used these three methodologies. Yes. Hikmah, Maw'adha, Hasana, and Jidal. Okay. The logical argument, the emotional uh, approach, and the argumentative approach. Then, he also used another approach. Yeah. Akhlaq, his manners. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And if you were bad tempered, ill mannered, people would have run away from you. Yeah. Okay, so the akhlaq of the Prophet was like a magnet that attracted people towards him. So that mm -hmm. was another approach. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used the letters that he used to send to the emperors and the kings, the Persian king, the Roman Caesar, uh, he wrote one to a king who used to be in Egypt, and so on and so forth. So he approached these letters as well, he sent them. This was in the days of Mecca, when he was in Mecca. Using this for 13 years as a strategy, then earned him some supporters. Yeah. Some historians say about, it would take 200 people believed in the Prophet ﷺ over the course of the 13 years in Mecca. Yes. Then he started sending ambassadors. So he sent Ja'far al-Tayyar to Ethiopia. He sent Mus'ab ibn Umair to Medina. And they both did an excellent job. Najashi, the king of Ethiopia, became a Muslim, believed in the message of Rasulullah wow. Mus'ab ibn Umair did a phenomenal job in Medina where he worked with the people, the tribes of Al-Aws, Al-Khazraj. Mm -hmm. He tried to unify them and he preached the Quran to them. And he was a young man. This is one of the actually examples we use of the youth and their important roles in the spreading of the message of Islam. Mm -hmm. In addition to Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam Allah alayhi, whom the Prophet sent him to Yemen. And again, he also propagated the message of Islam and so on and so forth. Yes. So you have these individuals. Then when the foundation was laid for the Prophet sallallahu to migrate to Medina, there, the first time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used the sword when the ayah was given to him in Surah Al-Hajj أُذِينَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Allah says beautifully أُذِينَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ Did not say يُقَاتِلُونَ Permission has been given to What's those What's the difference? Permission has been given to those who have been fought against Fought against Not fighting أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ يُقَاتَلْ مُشْ يُقَاتِلُونَ So the, the, the line over the top? That's right. أُذِنَ permission has been given to those who have been fought against. In other words, those who have been attacked. Not those who are attacking. Not those who are fighting. So the Muslims were not the ones. Why, why make it so complicated? I mean, anyone that wants to read the Quran isn't going to really follow well, that. This is the Arabic language. Quran and Arabiya. The Quran is in the Arabic language. So people have to understand the Arabic language in order to really understand the essence of the Quran. Without mm -hmm. it, you can't. So here, the ayah is very clear yeah. that now this is the only ayah, the first ayah, according to the historians and the interpreters of the Quran, yes. that this is the ayah that gave permission to the Muslims to engage in combat, physical mm -hmm. combat now. Before mm -hmm. then, they did not have that permission. Mm -hmm. Now, they were fought against, they were oppressed. They've been oppressed. They've been fighting against, they've been attacked. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ And Allah is capable of making them victorious. Mm -hmm. And then Allah says, الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ Those who have been kicked out of their house with no right other than them saying, لا إله, لا إله, إله, إله إلا الله. No, they say no they God. believe in Allah. And then Allah adds this to the ayah. وَلَوْ لَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ and if it weren't that Allah uses a group of people to defend the rights of others, then we would find places of worship. Different places. Allah lists four places of worship. Sawami'u. Sawami'u are the Jewish temples. Wabi'a'un, the Christian churches. Uh, salawat are general places of worships like temples for example وَمَسَاجِدْ and mosques where Allah is consistently remembered so you see when those people engage in combat they're not only defending Islam they are defending, defending religion at large faith at large they're defending the Jewish they're defending the Christian they're defending the non-believers they're defending the Muslim they're defending everybody and just, you know, as a very simple example yeah. from today's world, so yeah. that people can realize the context here. Yes. We find that those mu'mineen who rose to defend against the Islamic state of today, those okay. terrorist group of yeah. today, when they defended against them, they did not just defend the 
followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam or followers of the uh, Muslim Islam only. They defended the Christians, they defended uh, you know, the Yazidis, they yeah. defended the everybody, Shia, Sunni, those people protected the churches that are there, they protected the mosques that, that are there, the places of worship of other faiths. They did not only defend, this is the essence of fighting because they were attacked. They were mm -hmm. attacked by the terrorist group, these guys defended. Mm -hmm. Islam, same thing, the Prophet sallallahu never raised his sword until he was attacked. And in fact, that's why we have a thought in some scholars' writings where they suggest that the Prophet and the concept of combat is only defensive in Islam. Only defensive. Is it true? Now, that's one thought among the Shia scholars, some of the Shia thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take a look at the Prophet's combats, all of them were defensive. The Prophet never initiated combat. Look mm -hmm. at the first battle of Islam. What is the first battle in Islam? Badr. Badr. Where was it fought? Where is Badr? But it is on the outskirts okay. of, of, Medina. of Medina. Where did the Prophet stay? In Medina. So he was attacked. The people of Mecca approached him and they were attacking him. Any country in the world, any sovereign country in the world, when it's being attacked they by an defend. army, doesn't it have the right to defend itself? Mm -hmm. The Prophet was attacked. What's the second battle in Islam? Uhud. Where is Uhud? Oh, it's near Medina. Near Medina. Thank you. The Battle of Al Ahzab, Khandaq, in Medina. Mm -hmm. The Prophet was consistently, consistently being fought against, attacked by ally, allies, mm -hmm. and he, therefore he has the right to defend himself. He yes. has the right of every group. Mm -hmm. The other time the Prophet would engage in combat is when he engages in a peace treaty with a group of people mm -hmm. and they violate the terms of the peace of treaty, just like the Kuffar of Mecca, the Quraysh. For example, when they made the Sulh of Hudaybiyah, yes. the peace treaty in Hudaybiyah in the year 6 after Hijrah. Yeah. And among the terms was they would not kill any Muslims. They would not attack and persecute any Muslims. Mm -hmm. However, a year later, Quraysh violated the terms. They arrested a group of Muslims who were peaceful. They did not have any swords and they killed and executed all of them. As a consequence, the Prophet ﷺ said, now Quraysh has violated its terms of peace. And therefore, we need to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. And he raised the army to go to Mecca. Now, when he arrived in Mecca in the year 8 after Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ used the slogan that today is the day of mercy. He said to the Meccans, lay down your weapon and we will forgive all of you. And indeed, that's exactly what he did. If the Prophet ﷺ were bloodthirsty, if he were a murderer, God forbid, as some people accuse him, if he was seeking to spread his message through mm -hmm. war, why would he forgive the people who have been fighting against him for more than 20 years? Yeah. And he let them all go. Inshallah. Yeah. Sorry. And that famous statement of you're all forgiven. Mm -hmm. Which is also mentioned later on. But uh, Sheikh, now we'll go into a short break and we'll be back very short. So respective viewers, do stay tuned for Inshallah. We'll go into a short break and we'll continue the misconceptions revol revolving around uh, the preaching of Islam by Prophet Muhammad. Respective viewers, welcome back home. Inshallah, enjoyed uh, that short report. But we are back uh, with Dr. Sheikh Osama Al Attar. Welcome back, Habibi. Thank you. Very much. Uh, now, before the break, we were talking about how Prophet Muhammad, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, uh, in every fight or in every war he was involved in, uh, they were all in defense. And uh, the only way that, you know, if, if a treaty was broken or was, was violated uh, the prophet would fight uh, now in in the the, the meccan you know although he, the, the, there, were, there was no fight but the prophet still went to them and tried to attack them this is what they use so the intention of attacking was there but the intention is not the, 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 they did violate they did violate correct yes but the prophet still went to them instead of being defensive well, well, no, he was defensive. He never violated his terms of the treaty. They violated their terms of the treaty. In today's world... So that when, would just break a war? Uh, well, I mean, think about it. In today's world, if there's a treaty that's initiated between two groups, and one group violates the terms of that treaty mm -hmm. in such a disrespectful manner, in such a violent manner, then the other group has every right to defend itself of against course. this violation. But what's, what, what's and we see that in today's world, and no yeah. one complains about this. Of course. So same thing with the Prophet ﷺ. When they arrested a group of Muslims, executed them, 
This is an attack on Islam. Yeah. It's an attack on the government of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And that government needs to protect its citizens. Yeah. To protect those who belong to it. And therefore the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi went and approached Mecca. However, look at his approach. A very peaceful approach. Yeah. He did not kill a single person. And these were the same people who fought against him and tried to kill him and killed his uncle Al-Hamza. Yeah. And these people who have been fighting for more than 20 years against mm -hmm. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so the concept of the sword being used to spread Islam is a fallacy. And if we look at some fair writers, one of them like John Esposito. Yeah. Professor John Esposito, in some of his works, has clearly indicated that the Muslims did not use the sword to, to spread their, their message. You know, it was it was the manners of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa It was the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa Yes. It was the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa that spread the message. Yeah. And same thing if you take a look at Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle, a British writer, uh, who gave a series of lectures back in 1859, titled "The Heroes." This series can be found online. In one of the series, he names the hero is the Prophet Muhammad. Now he uses the Turkish. Uh, uh -huh. Spelling of the word. This is back in the 1800 during the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. So the word Muhammad and instead of Muhammad, they use Muhammad. <laughs> you know, but he says Muhammad the Prophet, and he considers him as a hero, not because of his wars, but because of the way that he managed to lead a nation of nomads, a group of people who are nomads, and turn them into a civilization. Mm. Okay. So if we take a look at some historians, <laughs> some writers, people who are fair yes. in their assessment of history, yes. none of them would accuse the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi of being bloodthirsty. Wa mm -hmm. billah. Wa billah. Uh, now, Shaykhna, uh, a lot of people do claim, and, and you just uh, mentioned something, that the Prophet did not spread Islam by the sword. Yet, uh, we see the Prophet saying, uh, if it wasn't for the wealth of Khadija, the sword of Abu Talib, and the faith of Abu Talib, there wouldn't be any Islam. Islam would not have, have spread. The sword being very important in that, um, that narration or, or, or that movement of the Holy Prophet. Um, so we do find the sword being or playing a very crucial role uh, in that. So if it wasn't for the sword, Islam would have uh, spread. Well, that's in a defensive role. Indeed, the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But why not mention defensive though? Well, I mean, if you take a look at the context though, like I said, you can take that hadith into, into perspective. When did Imam Ali fight? With the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, yeah. we just mentioned that the Prophet's wars were all defensive. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Sword of Imam Ali was in defense of Islam. Yes. Like I mentioned, if you take a look, all the made the wars of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, all were in defense. He was attacked, he defended. You know, or a violation was made of a treaty, and again he defended. Mm -hmm. So the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam was with him as he is defending, and hence, if it weren't for the sword of Imam Ali, yes. Imam Ali, with his bravery, with his heroism, managed to spread the essence of Islam. Mm -hmm. Another thing, though, people accuse Islam of. Yes. When they read some of the verses in the Quran, and they claim that these verses propagate violence. Yeah, I was just about to mention that. When they say, for example, that find them and kill them wherever you find them. Yeah. Uh, another ayah it says, for example, uh, people who fight against Allah and his messenger, they need to be sent in an exile and so on and so forth until it comes to the ayah where it says that you, they need to be cut with their right arm and their left leg or left arm and right leg. You know? um, so we find like, my gosh, you know, what kind of an execution is this? What is kind of, you know, isn't this absolute savage, you know, uh, savagery, um, you know, capital punishment, etc., etc. So what is the response to this? You know, in fact, one day I gave a lecture about this whole concept of violence in the Quran, myth or reality. You know? And the idea is when you take a look at these verses, they are talking specifically about combat. People who are constantly in combat against you, then you have the right to defend yourself. And those people who are in combat against you, you can go defend them, defend yourself, and, 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 and find them, and, and try to uh, fight against them. Mm -hmm. okay. So that is the concept. With the regards to the ayah where the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, uh, cut, cut them, etc., etc., the reason for the narration of this ayah, 
was that a group of uh, individuals came to the Prophet and they said, you know, we would like to become Muslims. Mm -hmm. He said, welcome to Islam. So they became Muslim. They stayed in Medina for a few days and they started coughing, they started getting ill. Yeah. They told the Prophet you know, I don't think this climate is really, uh, you know, good for our health. Can we move somewhere else? So the Prophet said, sure. He moved them to some, you know, rural area among a group of people who had some cattle, you know, camels, sheep, etc., etc. It was more like of a natural scene, fresher air. These people stayed with those individuals, those shepherds, hosted them, took care of them, fed them, uh, treated them like brothers. And then one day, these guys who were being the guests, all of a sudden became greedy. And they said, look at these guys, they have so many camels, so, so, many, so, much, so much sheep, so many sheep. So they one night executed the whole tribe and they stole everything. Now, when you have such a group of people who killed their hosts, who took care of them, fed wow. them, um, and, and, and did such a massacre, what would be the response? I mean, in today's world, what would people do to something like this? To some group of people? people well, the like law this? would take the, 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 requ the required measures. But going back to the verses you mentioned, Sheikh, is it not too extreme, though? You know, when you're in combat, cut off their, your, their right and left leg. or Look at the consequences, the sequence of the ayah. Those people may be exiled. They may be, uh, uh, the Quran says they can be exiled. Uh -huh. Send them in an exile. You in Fawmin al Is that like uh, other disciplinary matters? Yeah, okay. The last of them is that capital. Why though? Why so extreme? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some cases puts a harsh, a harsh punishment to deter people from committing the crime. That does not mean that this is what you need to do. And that's why the Prophet So it's not the first resort. Absolutely. And the Prophet ﷺ did not do it. He did not execute them. He did not, for example, cut, etc., uh, etc. Et you know, send them in exile. You know, that's what the Prophet did ﷺ. And therefore, it works when you send people into an exile to discipline them. Okay. That was the disciplinary measure that the Prophet ﷺ did. So mm -hmm. sometimes the Quran may list a punishment that might be severe this to deter people from committing the crime. Yes. Now, uh, a couple of... Uh, days ago i was reading an article uh, online and it mentioned that when the prophet uh, captured the prisoners uh, or captured uh, the people av after war uh, the war is after war after the war um, he executed almost a thousand after Badr. Um and then when you go to read the islamic uh, point of view uh, he let them free Yes, we no, don't have. Who do you? Who the, well, the Prophet ﷺ never executed prisoners. He never executed prisoners. He always uh, took care of them. In fact, in fact, in Islam, there were not even prisons at the time of Rasulullah ﷺ. So prisoners were not even kept in prisons. They were kept in people's homes. So they were looked after. They were fed, taken care of by their hosts, basically, because there was no prison mm -hmm. uh, in Islam, and. The Prophet ﷺ, specifically in Badr, in fact, he turned to the prisoners and said, those of you who know how to read, yes. if you can teach 10 people how to read and write, then it will set you free. So he used those prisoners in a positive way to educate the community, the Muslim community, mm -hmm. and he would let them go free. So that's how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with prisoners. And we have more than one occasion when the people, for example, of Tay. Atai, you know, Hatim yes. Atai, Hatim Atai. Very famous, his tribe again launched a war against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa oh, wow, okay. The Prophet sallallahu wa alayhi wa sent uh, an army to defend. Adi ibn Hatim Atai, the son of Hatim Atai, ran away. However, Safana, the, the daughter of Hatim, the sister of Adi, stayed. So she was taken as a prisoner. You know, the Muslims won. They took her as a prisoner to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa where she met with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she said, Ya Rasulullah, my father used to honor the poor. He used to feed the hungry. He used to take care of the people. And the Prophet ﷺ says, if your father were a Muslim, I would have said, may Allah's mercy be bestowed upon him. Indeed, your father was such a characteristic of a man. And he said, because of this, we will return everything back to you. All the goods that my Muslim fellow brothers have taken from you, they will send them back to you and will set you all free to go back to your city or to your tribe. 
So she went back to her tribe, taking everything back with her. Yes. So that's how he dealt with those people. And then Adi, her brother, came and told her, how was it? What happened? Like, how did that experience? You know, I, I managed to escape, but you guys were taken as prisoners. She told him, I thought that my father was the most generous person ever I've ever seen until I met this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa His generosity, his kindness, far exceeds anything that I've ever seen. And my suggestion is that you go and believe in him. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Adi went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he believed in him, and he became a sincere Shia of Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi where he lost two of his sons in the Battle of Safin mm -hmm. against Muawiyah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, a, a lot of people also, Shaykh, they claim that if the message of Islam was so pure, uh, then we see Islam deteriorating right now because Muslims are fighting their own Muslim fellow mates. Um, and that's one of the reasons that people hold back when it comes to converting to Islam, when it comes to actually learning about Islam, because they don't know what to learn. There's always so many views uh, uh, on just one aspect. You know, it's as simple as prayer. Someone's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's like 50 ways that people can pray. So people are, are, are confused when it comes to the Islam, because even within Islam, people are not, you know, they're, they're not uniting with... Well, you see, um, the dispute that is happening between some of the Muslims, this is not universal amongst all Muslims. There are about 2 billion Muslims in the world today. Mm -hmm. We are here now in a Muslim country. We don't find people killing each other right in the city. You know? But there are people willing to kill these people in the city. No, no, there aren't. There aren't. However, what happens is with, uh, we see the following. There's a small fraction of Muslims who have misunderstood the religion of Islam and they're causing corruption. Mm -hmm. If you really look at the numbers, they may be, I don't know, I don't really have statistics, but I mean, 100,000 to 100,000 people. Yeah. Okay. Out of 2 billion, that's the number that you have. But it is these people who make the news. When you go to any nation, to any country, it is the people who make the news that give a perspective of what that country is like. Whenever you have, for example, look at Canada, and I know you're Canadian, you love, you, you love Canada, and, 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 and a few years ago, yeah. A hockey team, the Vancouver Canucks, lost the Stanley Cup, so there were riots. Yeah, the, the and, riots and, and happened. They started burning yeah. police cars or whatever. Well, that made international headlines. When people look at this and say, "Oh, well, Canadians, they burn yeah, police cars," is that really what they people do? Well, I mean, that just, just gives them an, an improper perspective of who Canadians are. They're very peaceful people, and yeah. And, and, and I'm proud Canadian myself. Alhamdulillah. So, 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 it's what makes the news that sometimes makes gives a false perspective of who the true people in Canada are or the people of that uh, religion and so on and so forth. What we see in the world today, this deviation that is happening, it's such a minute number of people, but it is them who's making the news. And hence we think that, you know, this is really what is happening across all of the Muslims. But yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's not across all Muslims. Many Muslims are living coexisting in peace, uh, helping each other, uh, protecting one another. And again, the example of this militia group in Iraq who defended the religious sanctity of the country, they respected everybody, Shia, Sunni, uh, Muslim, non-Muslim, etc. So that is a demonstration of the unity of the people of Islam. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, inshallah, Shaykh, we do thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight and talking about uh, the misconceptions, clearing them up. Uh, so people can understand uh, what really Islam is all about uh, and how do we actually uh, portray uh, Islam or preach Islam. Now, Sheikhna, we do have a couple of uh, seconds left, uh, a minute or less than a minute. Uh, just three tips uh, for the people who are trying to spread Islam the proper way, but maybe they don't have the platform or the means to. Uh, just three tips, quick tips. Well, first of all, what we, we need to understand the Quran. Don't look at one part of the Quran. We need to look at it as a Very whole. important. So that's one thing very important. Islam is the message of peace. Yes. But we need to understand the context of these verses. Second, our characteristic and behavior is mm -hmm. extremely important. Yes. That's what people, first of all, look at. The minute they see our akhlaq, our manners, they would love the religion of Islam. And that's what the Prophet yep. used to do. Third, is we need to really develop a proper understanding of our theology, aqa'id, such that we can have a strong belief into this beautiful religion and this way we can spread it and propagate it to the others mm -hmm. thank you very much Sheikhna, for joining us tonight once again respective viewers thank you very much for joining us tonight hopefully we can learn from uh, people like Sheikh Osama Al-Attar uh, 
how uh, to actually spread the message of Islam in the most proper way with wisdom, good manners, and argue with those in the best of voice. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.